and welcome to Japan Expert Insights and our Japanese Politics 101 room. Every Sunday, Timothy Langley, Chief Executive Officer of Langley Esquire, a Tokyo-based public affairs consultancy and host Maya Matsuoka, bring to you the latest developments in Japanese politics. In this podcast, we welcome comments, questions and opinions. So if you haven't done so yet, join us next time. In the meantime, you can find us at japanexpertinsights.com and our YouTube channel where we upload all the conversations on Japanese politics, business insights and the Japan's role in the Indo-Pacific region. This week, our main topic will be the new cabinet of Prime Minister Kishida, the ministers and the policies they intend to implement while in office. Timothy, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Maya. And thanks, everybody, for joining us um, on a Sunday morning. So with Kishida now um, our uh, prime minister for the last almost three weeks, he's put together a cabinet. The cabinet um, consists of, um, you know, uh, 13. Uh, let, let's say the cabinet is um, consists of uh, 21 people. Usually when you see them um, sitting down and the prime minister comes in and everybody stands up and then they sit down in these low seats. That's 21 uh, cabinet ministers that are in that room when they have their cabinet minute, um, meetings. Uh, there are other ministers that join them, but of the, the formal cabinet, uh, 13 of these 21 are first timers, first time in any cabinet. Um, it's an 18 to three ratio, uh, men to women. There are uh, two ministers that are 50 years or younger there are five ministers that are between 50 and 59 and uh, two thirds is 60 years and older, which includes two of them, which are 77 years old. Both of them are 77 years old and they are also first timers. So it gives you a little bit of a, a texture. And there are two ways to look at how the prime minister selects the cabinet. And in fact, it's rarely the prime minister who selects the cabinet. It is a distribution through a calculation, usually uh, due to uh, factional numbers and uh, standing and also who helped the um, individual become prime minister. Then there are benefits to that. So, um, uh, you know, if, if you've been really helpful in getting the prime minister elected, uh, you get a cabinet portfolio. And the great thing about having a cabinet portfolio for any member of the diet is, um, well, number, number one, you need to have at least two of them plus a party position traditionally to be considered as prime minister and everybody wants to become prime minister. But more importantly, um, once you become a minister, um, you are, people don't call you sensei anymore. They call you daijin, um, minister. And that title stays with you even after you finish becoming minister. So um, that's a pretty good thing when you're running in a campaign and um, you've got some upshot who is challenging you and they might call him sensei, they might call him son, but they're gonna call you daijin. So for those people who are kind of sitting on the fence or unsure, yeah, they wanna go with somebody who's uh, tried and, and tested. So when you're the prime minister or the party that is putting together the cabinet, it's either you're rewarding the people that got you there or you're preparing for um, something better. So you're trying to convince the population that you have a uh, breadth and depth in, in positions of great importance. You would think that since Kishida is coming into an election cycle immediately, that he would have gone for the second scenario to show the population that he's got depth and breadth and, and a great uh, foundation in the issues. Uh, he didn't take that route. He, he went the other route, uh, repayment for helping me get elected and um, a distribution along party lines. And as we know, uh, you know, the, the big winners here were um, Taro Aso and uh, Mr. Abe, former uh, uh, Prime Minister Abe, uh, and also uh, Amari, who um, pulled off a, a, a pretty sweet deal now that he replaced Mr. Nikai as the uh, Secretary General of the LDP. Mr. Aso became deputy prime minister, uh, deputy LDP president. He was deputy prime minister and foreign uh, finance minister. You remember that he had two portfolios. Now he's just got one, but he's the deputy LDP president, which is pretty good shakes. And as 
uh, another consolation prize. He put his um, brother-in-law, he, he, I, maybe it's uh, overstatement to say he put him in, but uh, his brother-in-law is his replacement as foreign minister. That's a pretty big deal. Um, so there seems to be good consistency under the steady hand of Mr. Asso in the finance and the, the finance ministry of, of the country. Um, the election, the, the diet was uh, dissolved, uh, closed um, on Tuesday, on Thursday of this week, just, just a couple of days ago. And the elections for the 465 seats will start on Tuesday. So that's just in three days. It's an 11 day campaign and it culminates on Sunday, the last uh, day of this month. Um, so campaigning ends on Saturday. Um, the coalition between the LDP and Cometo of that 465 seats, they have 305 seats. So it's a little, it, it's right teetering on two thirds and that, that two thirds uh, supermajority was captured in the last election for the uh, up, uh, lower house under the um, guidance of Mr. Abe. So the LDP did extremely well, um, but all indicate, indications are that it won't be able to maintain that. And uh, several people have run various analysis of um, how much they're going to lose, not how many they're going to gain. And you'll remember that in the waning days of uh, Su the Suga administration, there was fear that the LDP would lose, you know, uh, more than 60 seats and push it below the majority. So um, in order to stay in the majority, they need to have 233 seats. They have 305 now. The coalition has 305 now. So um, that's that's a pretty big gap. Even Amadi has said, we think we'll be able to do 244. We will be able to capture 244 seats. Thereby, um, by themselves, the LDP will be in a, a majority. But with Cometo, they'll be between a majority and a supermajority. Um, but they do all acknowledge that uh, the LDP is going to take a step down. Uh, the leadership of, of Kishida is not that strong. Uh, the approval ratings when he came in has been uh, the lowest of the last uh, nine prime ministers uh, when they were um, approaching elections. So he's starting at a, at a lower spot, lower expectations. He, you know, what you can say that's good for him is that he has better approval ratings than Suga had when he left, but that's kind of not saying very much. So um, let's talk just a little bit about um, what are the policy prerogatives of the Kishida, Kishida administration or what it is that he kind of said. And then I'd like to talk about how he's backtracked a little bit. So um, in his uh, policy speech, you, you'll remember that he, he expressed, you know, right up front, uh, his determination to tackle the uh, coronavirus pandemic. And he's going to establish a new Japanese capitalism. What that means is you kind of scratch your head. But he's, he's, he's stated that he wants this new capitalism to be based on a virtuous cycle of growth and distribution of wealth and the new ec economic policy. And it's supposed to replace the kind of abenomics, the neoliberal approach, which um, was kind of trickled down, allowed the companies and the wealthy to get wealthier and thereby uh, spend more money with investment. And um, in fact, what we found is, and he's, he said this before, a growing disparity between those that have money and those that don't have money. And he wants to address this uh, inequity among um, you know, the people in Japanese society. He said that several times. Um, so he's... Um, his pronouncements, you might remember, um, just uh, last, well, it happened this week, but the, the stock market, he said things over the weekend about, you know, uh, economic growth and uh, fattening the, the middle class and redistributing wealth so that the poor people are, are fewer in numbers and then the rich people have less money to, um, to hoard. Uh, the stock market took a huge hit. 
he corrected himself the next day and it recovered uh, slightly. Uh, so uh, the market is a little bit jittery watching what he says and what he's, he means. And uh, he backtracked on his, his pronouncement. He said, I'm, I'm going to shoot for a growth first and then distribution second. Whereas earlier he said, I, I, we need to dis, you know, distribute money so that the, the poor people and get the, um, get the economy back on, on track. Um, he um, has also said that he's going to um, uh, commit a higher budget for the main measures against the, the COVID pandemic. And he'll seek to carry out, you know, income redistribution to rectify these income disparities. How he does that is uh, a bit of a mystery. And you'll remember that um, there were two scenarios that we predicted, that I predicted, that were options for uh, the election. And when Kishida became uh, prime minister, he announced uh, an earlier one, one that wasn't under much consideration. And he jumped the gun on that uh, on purpose to make the opposition, um, to take the take the wind out of the opposition to take get them a little bit off guard and also although he says um, things to to appeal to the the population he doesn't have a lot of time to actually explain it and so moving up the election date earlier um, keeps him out of the the spotlight for explaining how he's going to do what he's going to do um, he did have a couple of days in the diet full diet uh, questioning and answering uh, you might have been following that. The opposition party was vociferous in in attacking him and asking him for, um, uh, you know, what his what his policies are for um, maintaining, you know, a, the target of a two percent inflation rate when we haven't been able to do that right now, and how he's going to um, uh, address the uh, wealth redistribution, unlike you know the Abe. Abenomics uh, trickle down theory. How? What is he actually going to do? So he was under the gun for um, for a couple of days in doing that. And this time last week, when we were together, I observed that the pronouncements on what his policy is going to be um, are basically going to be focused on him, and the cabinet ministers are going to be a little bit quiet and not uh, really come out, except maybe to endorse it. And there has been a little bit of movement there, and it's very important to kind of point that out. So um, his his uh, finance minister, whatever his finance minister says, is important because he's not really a finance guy. His major claim to fame is that his brother-in-law is uh, Tato Aso. Um, but he's he's not a, a, a bad person. His father was um, uh, prime minister um, and a leader of one of the political factions. Um, he grew up as his uh, diet secretary for his father, like just about everybody did, like um, Mr. Abe did with his his father. And I was I was in the same faction at that time. I was the diet secretary for my boss. Um, um, Mr. Abe was the diet secretary for his boss. Uh, so we saw each other um, every week at breakfast meetings and on worked on election campaigns. But um, uh, Shinichi. Uh, Suzuki as uh, foreign as a uh, uh, finance minister has pledged that he would you know stick to bold monetary easing flexible fiscal spending and a growth strategy and those pronouncements are just the exact thing that is has been promoted as abenomics so he's he's not diverging much from what has been done in the past and he's not really staking a, a new claim based on what um, the prime minister has said. There's a minister in charge of economic revitalization, a pretty important uh, position. His name is Yamagiwa. He is actually from my election district in uh, uh, Kawasaki, where I live. And he said that he would take all measures uh, to revitalize the economy. And additionally, that um, he would um, uh, endorse the passing of an economic um, uh, stimulus package in trillions. I mean, it sounds like kind of what uh, Joe Biden said in trillions of yen and, um, you know, prop up the economy by doing that. And I think one of the reasons why the 
election date was moved up was to f put this flash in the pan without um, having the need or the opportunity to um, to actually explain it. There was a little bit of controversy in the selection of the ministry, the METI minister, the Minister of Economy, Trade and Industry. It is now and been confirmed Mr. Hagiuda. Um, he was initially um, trial ballooned to be the uh, Secretary General and that didn't last very long because uh, people thought it gave Mr. Abe, even as a winner of uh, getting Kishida elected, uh, way too much. It was unjustified in terms of the power share. So uh, they gave Hagiuda, who is in the Abe, um, the uh, Hosoda faction, um, this important position. And he's interesting because he's a little bit hawkish and he's a little bit um, more nationalistic, as you might expect, on uh, trade and industry policy. And he actually went a little bit off script. He said it's unrealistic to expect that Japan can achieve an income doubling, which is what um, uh, Kishida wanted. He wanted to have a, an income doubling plan. Uh, he, he titled it the income doubling plan of the Rewa era. Um, because a, a redistribution of wealth to the Japanese people and from the, um, the co uh, companies, it's, uh, it's, it's basically um, impossible to achieve. And he, he related a little bit that when this was done under the um, a previous administration in the 1960s, the base of, of increasing annual salaries um, over a, a, a multiple years, five years, was possible because the base was was lower and the economy was was steaming during the um, approaching the bubble years. Right now, it's it's much harder to do that with the average income um, of Japanese salaries being around four point three million, if you can believe that. And to double that figure, it would increase it would involve the annual salaries to increase by five percent for fifteen years or seven percent for seven years. How are you going to do that? How can you plan that? And uh, so uh, he, he backtracked a little bit about that. And then the, the, um, the, the third minister I'd like to just uh, mention is a first time minister, a 46 year old um, uh, first time, um, yeah, first time minister uh, for the um, nation's economic security uh, agency. It, it is assigned to the cabinet. It's not a, um, like a, a minister, it's, it doesn't have a whole office and, and lots of people, but it is a ministerial portfolio that uh, resides within the part, the president, uh, the um, prime minister's office. And um, uh, his, his charge is to craft a national strategy to tackle the issue of intellectual property theft and cyber espionage. So a lot of people were concerned a little bit about that because uh, it, they believe that this financial security is is bleeding into what the finance ministry is doing or what the defense ministry is doing, and it's not. It's it's actually focused more limitedly on uh, the economy, on IP, on cyber security, and we've talked about this uh, in this room before about the the huge number of hacks and and espionage that that goes on in this country that really doesn't. Um, get much publicity it doesn't see the light of day but it is a huge huge issue for companies and uh, for the government here uh, for the banks in, in particular and these um, typically come out of North Korea and China not so much out of Russia so um, this new agency is um, dedicated to uh, implementing that and um, so this is the first you know first minister for this particular portfolio um and so a lot of a lot of um uh concern or a lot of uh interest because like the digital agency this one needs to have its fingers in a lot of the different um ministries and um if you're in one of those ministries and you've been groomed and raised up in it you really don't like um people encroaching on that, even though they're coming from the prime minister's office, or maybe particularly because they're coming from the um, prime minister's office. So um, in, in all of these pronouncements that uh, Mr. Kishida has said, and that has been 
somewhat revised by uh, members of the administration, very lightly though. Um, it, it comes out that um, Takaichi, Sanai Takaichi, who was a candidate for prime minister, she maintained her portfolio in the LDP, a powerful position. And it turns out, interestingly enough, that most of the policy pronouncements that she promoted in her campaign are the ones that are living to see the light of day. So it's a modified um, um, area for Mr. Kishida's pronouncements, but uh, a main focus on um, crisis management and a focus on uh, investments in high growth potential uh, industries and companies. So you just saw that um, uh, TSMC from Taiwan, they're, they're investing hugely in a new chip plant here in Japan. That was approved. It's been on the boards for, for quite a while, but it's beginning to take more momentum. Um, let's see, what am I going to talk about now? I've got next on my agenda is the opposition. So um, the opposition parties, there are maybe five, six serious opposition parties. Um, they're not that large. Um, and they really, um, when, when it comes to distinguishing themselves from the LDP, most of the time, since they're not that large, they're um, only perceived as being complainers, even on the diet floor. They're criticizing and complaining about what the LDP is doing, what it, what it shouldn't do, and what are the scandals and that sort of thing. So um, they don't like to do that. That's the kind of uh, underdog position that they occupy. And how do you, you know, gain uh, the electorate's um, attention when you don't have a good policy statement, you haven't led the government. And when you did lead the government, it was pretty disastrous. How, how are you able to come up and, and challenge the status quo? So in this current election, they've tried it a little bit in by-elections over the last um, uh, 12 months or so, you, you're seeing a coalition of some of the opposition parties, even though they're diametrically opposed on certain issues. The number one and the number two uh, opposition parties are the Constitutional Democratic Party and the Japan Communist Party. The other opposition parties are, are far smaller. So the Constitutional Democratic Party has 111 seats. That's, that's pretty good. 111 seats out of the 465 seats. And the Japan Communist Party has 12 seats. Not very many, but it's, um, it's enough for them to actually um, carry some throw weight. So these two parties are talking about how they can um, form a coalition for the purposes of getting elections. And, and I have to talk about the election seats and how people get elected for people to kind of understand this. So in, in, the, um, in the election, there are 105 election districts over the 47 prefectures. And um, 289 of the seats that are up, so there are 465 seats, 289 of them are in single seat districts. So that means there's one seat and then there are several candidates that are running uh, for that seat. And the, the coalition of the opposition parties, what they say is, uh, we have this district here, uh, we can send a candidate and we know that you wanna send a candidate. We're not gonna send a candidate and we're gonna tell all of our voters, instead of voting for a uh, you know, communist party candidate and probably losing, we're not gonna put a candidate here, but we endorse our, op our coalition opposition party, the, for example, the Constitution Democratic Party candidate. So please vote for him because we're getting um, a rebound in another district where it's more important for us and we have a better candidate. I, I, I hope you understand that, that kind of um, uh, arrangements that, that are being had. So um, there's a lot of horse trading that's going on there because they have an LDP candidate. There's almost an LDP candidate in every election district, but not in all of them. In, for Komeito, they, they have um, a broader um, reach throughout the country. They have a very strong um, uh, voter base. They vote very uh, consistently along party lines. 
and and they they go out far more consistently than LDP people because they're the Komeito are are bonded together by a, a certain philosophy and they they they're much stronger than the LDP. Um, so with the LDP and um, Komeito, there are also seats that Komeito gives up to the LDP because the LDP is going to give them some seats. They're not going to run a candidate in an election district in one of the, um, uh, you know, the 289 uh, single seat districts so that Komeito can win. So Komeito now has, you know, uh, uh, 20, uh, 20, 25 or so um, uh, members in the uh, lower house and they want to maintain that or increase that um, so that as a coalition, the LDP gets closer to the supermajority than it has right now. And that's kind of not likely, but uh, they'll keep it for another day. Um, so the house was closed just this last week on Thursday. The campaign begins on Tuesday in two, two, three days. And then the election is on Sunday, the last day of this month. So there are a couple of things that you need to look out for um, as we approach this, this election and the candidates come out swinging. So just, just a bit of a digression. Um, I'm, I'm working policy issues for clients all the time. I'm in the diet all the time. Uh, we're working on issues. All of that work has essentially stopped for the last maybe four weeks. Uh, we, you can go into the diet, you can have meetings with members, you can go to uh, the bureaucracies and, and follow up on issues that are going, but nothing's really moving and nothing's going to move until after the election. So right now, even though the, the diet has been closed down and campaigning doesn't start until Tuesday, everybody, there's nobody in Kasumigaseki, all of the members of the parliament are already in their election districts uh, preparing for their election, getting their posters ready, taking their their uh, photographs, getting um, you know their individual manifestos going. Um, so that will continue until election. Uh, we're not going to have a whole lot of policy movement, but um, let's talk just a, a tiny bit about um, the uh, election. How how people get voted for in the lower house. Um, because this is important and it tells you and it reveals to you why Mr. Nikai was so powerful. So there are, there are 289 single seat districts and then there are 176 regional proportional representation blocks. So um, between the 289 single seats and the 176, that equals all of the houses, all of the seats in the, the lower house. So how you get elected in one versus the other is different. Um, so if you're a, um, a good, powerful candidate, you've had um, industry experience, or maybe you were in the, um, the bureaucracy and you were tapped by somebody uh, famous who endorses you, you might put your name on uh, the uh, poster and uh, encourage the um, LDP to give you money to run a campaign. And that's where Nikai comes in. We like this guy. I think he'll be able to win. So he's going to get our support. Um, so uh, that's in the vast majority, like um, what? Uh, three, three fifths of all of the seats that are open are in that category. There are two fifths of the seats that are dedicated to the regional uh, proportional system. And how that is determined is it's a list of seats that are uh, a list of candidates that are defined by the political faction. Um, I'm sorry, the political party. So you vote for the party and then the party has selected who the candidates are. And if the party gets a lot of votes, then the numbers of the candidates on their list goes. So number one goes, number two, if they earned 30% of the total votes in proportional representation, then kind of they would expect 30% of the seats, 30% of the 176 seats to be theirs. Um, and how you get on that list and who puts you there kind of once again goes to Mr. Nikai. So you want to be high on the list, not low on the list. 
Um, and when you're doing your campaigning on the, the two different kinds of campaigns, one for the single seat representation, you're promoting yourself and how good you are and your teeth are straight. And the second one, you're promoting the, the, the party that you represent because the, the more people that vote for your party because they've got guys like you who have straight teeth and, you know, you know, dress in, you know, the fashion brands and you say really interesting things, then they vote for the party. And your hope is that um, you are, uh, the party gets enough votes so that you're maybe 12 down the list and uh, maybe number 12 represents, you know, 28% of the total number of the votes and then you're in. So there's a, a um, quality difference between a single seat winner and somebody who came in on the list. So if you, you through the power of your own persuasion, you got a seat in the single seat, you're given a little bit more discretion and a little bit more attention than if you're on the list. And you can also um, be on both, you can have a um, your uh, single seat representation and you can also run on the party list as well. People have done that. They've lost in the single seat district, but they've won in the uh, proportional representation. Those are called uh, zombie um, uh, Gein, zombie representatives, because they lost, and only through a um, the quirk of fate that they were on the list high enough uh, were they able to become a member of the parliament or continue to be a member of the parliament. Um, and those guys are not given as much um, leeway as the other ones. There are five things to look at as we move into the um, the election, and I'd like you to to pay attention to that. We have another um, clubhouse before the election. So we've got next Sunday, we'll, we'll be right in the thick of the elections. And then the Sunday after that will be election day. So just during this period of time until we get together um, next week, keep, keep your eye on these things. There are five things I'd like you to keep your eye on. Take a look at or, or be um, aware, cognizant of what the opposition party's stance is on various issues. And that will change gradually, that it, it might shift, but they will be very vociferous to distinguish themselves from what the LDP is saying. The second thing you need to look at is how Kishida shifts on his pronouncements. So take a look at what he pronounced when he wanted to become prime minister. When he became prime minister, what else he said, and then he got slapped around, the stock market took a tumble, he, he revised his statements. His cabinet ministers are coming out with a little bit of refinement. And that is going to be, that is going to uh, continue. So pay attention to what he says and how he has changed his his view. He's he's actually um, termed and and views himself as as a bit of a moderate a moderate, and as a coalition builder. So he's not really expected to be, you know, firm and taking the charge and and making vast uh, real pronouncements that he puts his his career on. Uh, so you can expect to see a little bit of that. And that will tell you what his administration will be like after the election. Um, pay attention to campaign attendance and how they're con canvassing. So um, Mr. Kishida will be on a schedule to stand on the top of the trucks with 16 microphones into both hands as he's speaking, you know, very powerfully and surrounded by other members uh, on the top of the truck. Th this is a... Um, a sign of their appeal to the population. So look at the, the numbers who are going out. It's going to be a, um, a real uh, test because to get people out to vote, they have to believe in something. They have to want to make their voice heard. And if you've got a, a lukewarm candidate who's just kind of doing with the status quo, I, the, the people are gonna stay home. They're not gonna be that interested in contributing. Um, similarly, take a look at the weather and the controversies that arise so that um, if, if the population is excited, if there's a controversy up, if there's a scandal that comes up, then people will come out and vote. And if it, it's, it, history tells us that if about 53, 54% um, of the people go out to vote, the LDP would do relatively well. If it's lower than that, it, uh, history tells us that the proportion of LDP people voting decreases. So the when it goes below 53, 54%, it's mostly the LDP people who are sitting on their hands. And then finally, take um, 
take note of geopolitical incidents, things that are going on in North Korea, in Taiwan, maybe in the United States with regard to uh, stimulus spending and um, the Green Deal and build better now, that sort of thing. Um, those, those things will have a, a big impact on, on, um, on the campaign and on how Mr. Kishida does. And then finally, I'd just like to wrap it up by saying, um, once, once we have um, the election behind us, this is speaking a little bit um, uh, prematurely, but we've got two weeks in front of us. Um, uh, the, the election finishes, Mr. Kishida, presumably, um, I'm pretty sure will still be a prime minister. There are two things you can look forward to. Number one is a supplementary budget, which will probably be the budget of all budgets. He's going to try and appeal to everybody and say he has a mandate to um, do these things based on the numbers that he uh, generated. And that's what you, you need to look for. It will be a tremendous supplementary budget, whether they'll be able to pull it through or not. Is it something else? But he will say that I have a mandate and these are the things I'm going to do. And then policy and, and the work of the diet and in the bureaucracies will continue anew. And then the um, other thing to look forward to is a potential cabinet reshuffle. I think the cabinet that um, we have now is is probably due for a reshuffle. So if the LDP does extremely well and they win a lot of seats, um, maybe that they they will stay there. Uh, the, all of the individuals will stay there, but it's more likely that they're not going to do very well. And uh, based on um, exit poll um, information, they might change some of the um, some some of the cabinet ministers. Um, expectations are being um, kind of modified now. Mr. Ahmadi, who is the uh, cabinet, sec the um, secretary general of the LDP, uh, said that, you know, we, we, we will do OK. We're going to lose, you know, um, a certain number of seats, but not too many. I think he's setting expectations low so that when uh, the LDP has the race and they win more, that they can use that as a victory chart, a uh, chant. And um, at this point in time, I kind of think that we might be surprised by the um, the numbers that the LDP generates. Uh, will be people will be surprised that they did as well as they they do. Um, I, I could change that um, over the next week or so, but anyway, that's um, that's my view. Michael Tuchek joined. He's in the house. I have a few things, uh, a few ancillary comments uh, on your uh, presentation. If if that's okay. Oh no, please. Please go. This ahead. is um, this is your business, Michael. You do this, you know. Yeah. Uh, every day. Uh, no one's expect. Okay, going through the points. No one's expecting any kind of income doubling, and so Hagiuda is just stating reality. Uh, but uh, Kishida is from the Kochikai faction, and its ancestor is the Ikeda faction of. Ikeda Hayato, the prime minister, who did have an income doubling plan that did take place in the 1960s. So it's it's a greatest hits uh, a package when Kishida is talking about it. Remember our faction, we're the folks who did this for you. Uh, and you have to be old like me uh, to remember that. Uh, and since many of the uh, voters are going to be older, uh, that has a, a certain uh, ring to it. Uh, in terms of the uh, the, the uh, seats that are up on the proportional list, uh, the, the 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 key twist to all of to the to the regular way that proportional lists work, which is a party chooses its number one candidate, its second, its third, and fourth, and fifth, and sixth, and depending on how high up on the list you are, you either get a seat or you're not, you don't. Uh, the human relations uh, within uh, the LDP make it impossible for anyone to accept not being number one. Uh, I, I wanna be number one on the list. Why, why am I number three? Uh, so in both the LDP and the uh, lists for the uh, for, for the uh, CDPJ and most parties, in fact, what happens is, is that everyone is number one, at least everyone who is running in a district. Uh, and then you say, well, wait a minute, if everyone's number one, how do they get chosen off the list? 
Well, it's based upon uh, the principle of if you're a, a double listed candidate running in both the district and on the proportional list, the only reason you'd be picked off the proportional list is if you lost in your district. But it depends on how badly you lost. If you lost by just a, a few votes or a few thousand votes, you, you, you made a best effort. And then that is the way that one is chosen. The people who lost the least badly, who lost by the fewest votes, or who lost by the fewest percentage of votes, are the ones who come off the proportional list first. So it's a, it, it's a list of best losers, ones who made a big effort, <laughs> still fought until the last day, and were not able to make it. But you should give them a, a, a nice silver medal, and a, the nice silver medal is the zombie position. Uh, you've come back from the dead. Even if you're in a district and you know you're going to lose, it's worth it to fight and fight and fight until the final day. Yeah, I think yeah, the I think proportional the representation is th – the list there is a little bit hard to grasp for most people because usually election is – you see all the posters. You see the billboards in your neighborhood with people's um, pictures plastered on it. Um, you'll start seeing that on Tuesday. Um, the, a lot the, of those people are on the proportional list as well. In fact, mm -hmm. in the case of the LDP and the CDPJ, the top people in – are going to be all on that list. Uh, it, it's, it's a fallback position. You never really can lose. You, you're always going to either be elected in the district or pulled off the uh, proportional list. That's the guarantee. Yeah. yeah. So just to, to tie it up, when you walk into the voting booth, you have two ballots. One ballot is you write the candidate's name for the single seat, and then uh, the other one is you write the name of the uh, political party that you're voting for, and then that vote goes for the uh, proportional representing representing uh, seats. So you get two ballots there. In terms of in terms of the uh, policy, uh, everything right now is for the election, so nothing is believable you know, on any side. Uh, <laughs> that is so true. <laughs> none none of the policy positions. Uh, are remotely realistic uh, or in any way uh, there's no uh, roadmap toward their eventual transformation into actual legislation or, or, or regulation. Uh, none of it is true. Uh, and uh, the uh, therefore, uh, as you were saying in terms of, of people standing up on top of the sound trucks, uh, the goal here for this uh, intense uh, two-week-plus period that we have – well, actually, now it's Sunday, so it's two weeks uh, – is merely to get the, the partisans, the people who have already been sold on your point of view, to show up uh, on the, in the poll, uh, at the polls on, in two weeks' time. It's too late to try to persuade people. You've got ideas that are worth – uh, converting to our side for it's just to rouse those who are raw raw. So it's a greatest it, it, again. It's a greatest hits package, uh, and uh, you know we're here for growth. Everybody's for growth, Kishida. Come on, uh, you know, or we're here for making sure that everybody has a uh, a decent wage. We're all for that, Mr. Edano. Come on. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's just there to get everybody excited about voting. That's that's the key. Right. Every yeah. every single party wants its partisans to show up and hopes that the other side uh, is bored to tears. Uh, that's 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 what I, that's my read on policy. There's nothing real to read from what's being said today. The other kind of interesting point here, Michael. Maybe you can also share some some insight on it is um, I've been involved in um, the elections, election campaigns ever since I've been um, doing this because elections are, are a huge part of how politics moves. And I've always been told since the very beginning, and I hear it even today, elections in Japan are like Matsuri. They're the current replacement for what in the past was Matsuri. It is a, it, it's a festival. The, you know, don't take it too seriously. It's a party. You know, it's, it's kind of... You know, it's not bare knuckles fights. It's it's kind of a party. 
<laughs> well, that might have been because you worked for the LDP. <laughs> <laughs> for the opposition, uh, it's a it's a bare knuckles fight, and the LD play doesn't play fair. Uh, and uh, the, so uh, the it is very serious. Uh, the CDPJ is taking a huge uh, hit in terms of reputation in order to work with the communists because of the very real problem of yep. if there's a CDPJ uh, candidate and a communist candidate running in the same district, the communists will bleed off enough the votes to give the seat to the LDP. They, the CDPJ has to get that communist candidate out of the district running. Hmm. And the when Amari Akira introduced uh, the LDP's election strategy, the first thing he said was a, a, a throwback. He said, we can't have a situation where the communists can be in government. You out there, you've got to save Japan from a communist takeover. And you were saying, wow, so that's so 1980s. Uh, but, uh, you know, that's that's one of the possibilities in terms of uh, the if they do win power, the, there would be for the first time in post-war history, uh, communists in government. Uh, so the and 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 that's a, and Amari is counting that nobody wants that and hoping that that's going to be the electoral magic, you know, not. Kishida's economic plans, uh, not his, not everyone's, uh, you know, smiling face or, or, or white gloves, but the, the the fear of communist takeover. So yeah, it's 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 real. It's tough. You make hard decisions. It's not a matsuri for the opposition. It might be that their um, their strategy to form a coalition turns out to be just the wrong move. And already they're predicting Ishin no Kai to do extremely well this election, probably be one of the, uh, the, the better winners proportionally um, because of the, the coalition building that the, uh, the Constitution Democratic Party and the communists have formed. Yeah, it's, it's a tricky question uh, in terms of where, do, where does the marginal voter go who uh, is, doesn't want to vote for the LDP, but... Uh, is wary of this uh, alliance between the CDPJ and the communists. Uh, and most of the voters are the unaffiliated. Yeah, most of the voters, well, the 40, 48% of the voters say uh, don't know or no party at all when they're asked in, in public opinion polls. The thing is, is those people traditionally don't show up because they don't have a stake in, 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 the, uh, in the election. And that's where we get these numbers of 53% turnout, 54% turnout. It's because the ones who didn't, weren't able to decide, decided not to go at all because they weren't able to just choose a particular candidate. Getting those people uh, to vote has always been the dream of the opposition, uh, but they've never worked out a formula to make it happen. Mm -hmm. Right. That's too bad for the opposition. <laughs> it's too bad for everyone well, probably and for they, democracy in general. Yeah, in general, too. Let me <clears throat> uh, broach a, another subject, which is kind of interesting. So I made a presentation this last week about uh, the Kishida cabinet and the administration, that sort of thing. And um, following that, there was a uh, presentation b uh, sponsored by the Japan Society of California, I believe. And... Uh, the vast amount of interest from that perspective was what happened to Konotaro. There was a lot of concern about Konotaro and we liked Konotaro and, you know, what's going to happen to him. And <clears throat> I think it's, it's easy for us to see right now that uh, his, his alliance, his um, uh, coalition building with uh, Koizumi, who was Minister of, of the Environment, both of them kind of were pushed to the side. And um, you can begin to see the signs that the, um, the emphasis on the environment is not that strong uh, under the current administration. You're already seeing a little bit of 
backtracking from um, you know the the commitments to uh, the COP the initiative and also the Kyoto Protocols, um, and it looks like you know uh, Kona was very much against um, nuclear power, and it looks like you know nuclear power is a, is a, a great industry building um, um, strategy, um, and I think the LDP is very much in favor of uh, nuclear power for uh, generating. Uh, you know, the power that's needed in, in Japan without, uh, you know, creating a, a carbon footprint. So it looks like there's going to be some changes there that you can anticipate. But um, uh, it's interesting that the people that, that are here in Japan, it, we, we stopped talking about uh, Konotaro, you know, as soon as the cabinet was formed. Um, but it seems like he's such a, a favorite and a darling for uh, those that are you know, overseas and, and uh, a lot of Japan watchers who are watching from afar. I just wanted to uh, make that observation. It's kind of interesting. So um, LDP pledged a uh, promise during the uh, election campaign to discuss they have been different, or should I say um, separate sur surname between the married couple. But now they're saying that they would take out the pledge so if I'm not mistaken, um, about 95% of women change their maiden name, uh, including myself, to spouse's name. So why do you think it's hard for the members of parliament to even discuss about it? So what is your thoughts on this, Timothy? Oh, it's a man's world. Um, I think that the fact that, you know, three of the 21 um, cabinet ministers are women. It's it's great, but I think uh, you know it's they need to uh, pretty much toe the line too. And I don't think you have a you know really strong proponents, uh, women proponents for for this issue, and very few men. The men don't really care one way or the other because it it, it doesn't impact them as much. But I think you're gonna you're gonna see a lot of uh, a lot of um, pronouncements to get the votes out, but I think you'll probably see a um, little traction on it. And I know it's disappointing because it looks like we're we're moving forward, but with a lot of things here in this country, you know, it's it looks like you're taking two steps forward and then you take three steps back and two steps forward. You do make incremental change, but um, on this particular issue, um, I don't know how much heat it is, um, it is generating among the population. So, so, People who want to have their name changes, it's it's like you. You would like to have that ability, but it already happened to you. So although you might um, talk about it, it's it's like um, it's like lobbying for um, inheritance tax. The people it impacts the most, they just already died, so th they don't have an effective voice, effective lobby. And similarly with the name change, I think people will say, you know, I'd like my daughter to have that option. But um, they're they're not really in the firing line on an issue like this, and so I think that's why that, that it's hard to get a spokesman who is really um, somebody that's going to be aggrieved if the if the decision is uh, one way or the other, because by the time it becomes an issue, it's it's policy wise, it's it's too late to kind of actually influ uh, effect change on it. If I could just sure go on on that. Uh, it, the reason why they can't uh, include it in the uh, discuss, even dis discuss it for uh, as a party promise, it, the reason for that is about 10 million votes, and those 10 million votes are affected by uh, the uh, organization known as uh, Jinja Honcho, the uh, organization of uh, Shinto shrines, uh, which uh, has one of its bases the pre preservation of the Japanese family. Uh, and the fear among uh, conservative members of the LDP uh, is that uh, the shrines will turn against them mm -hmm. if they show any kind of liberality on this point, even though uh, it, it, it's uh, putting Japan in line with the practices of most advanced industrialized nations to have the possibility of separate surnames. Uh, that, uh, that, international aspect to it is not nearly as important to the LTV members as uh, having Jinja Honcho on their side. So they make that decision based upon that, is the, my general sense of it. Thank you, Michael. That makes sense to me. 
So from Ted Gover, uh, the question is, uh, have you heard anything on the timing as to when Japan will allow vaccinated foreign visitors? In? Yeah, I get that question quite a bit. And I have um, um, people who are running companies that have have executives parked in other areas of of Asia who are supposed to be rotated to Japan that are in a long um, stream of waiting people. There are a lot of people there with their families and that sort of thing. Um, the, the Japanese are holding a very hard line on that. And I think once, um, once it's relaxed, then it will happen very quickly and you'll see a lot of things happening. Right now in Tokyo, they uh, dropped the uh, state of emergency and immediately the city changed. Immediately stores, um, uh, bars, restaurants started to open. People were being served drinks. And I think this issue is a, a hot button issue. I don't think anything's going to happen until after the election. But I think after the election, it will happen in, in pretty uh, quick steps. But um, I just received a request like this um, just this last week. We have an executive. We need some, some help. Who can, we, who can we talk to? And anybody that you can talk to that has an ability to influence change, they're already in their election district. If it's a bureaucrat that you think you're going to go to to get some change, they're not going to do anything until after their marching orders. The policy is in place and it's not going to change. Um, I don't know if, Michael, you have a better insight into that, but um, that's my two cents. My only insight is that nothing is going to change before the election. Uh, there's nothing that the government w w wants to do uh, less than to uh, get people upset for letting those foreigners in uh, when we're battling this disease. That's They don't want to deal with that. And so even though, again, it hurts Japan internationally in terms of its image, in terms of uh, getting people to come from, from outside, uh, they're focused on October 31st and nothing else. Right. Thank you. Ted, I hope that... Um... This answers your question to a certain point. And uh, Hayato, good morning. Oh, hi. hi. Good morning. Can you hear me? Good morning, Hayato. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, like, uh, one thing uh, that I kind of noticed uh, this at uh, least this, this week is, uh, you know, uh, the rest of the world has a huge like a discussion or, or maybe crisis of this uh, Chinese uh, invading Taiwan's airspace. You know, as you know, right? But like in Japan, like it's like nothing happened. You know. So everybody is just like, is talking about this election. Everybody's just you know doing that, and uh, the, and uh, and uh, it looks like you know lack of uh, national security you know discussions here at all, right? Because uh, if the China stays the way it is, you know, there's no no more Japan in another five years or so, right? So they can just come and take over Japan if the U.S. does not defend. So it's a huge crisis. But yeah, so for that, I'm very. Uh, surprised, uh, you know, that, that Japan, there's, uh, because Japan's media is all controlled by the, you know, U.S. embassy in Tokyo, right, and also the Japanese government, but but there's, uh, uh, you know, noticeably, like, absent, you know, the press, like, uh, a promotion on this, uh, promotion or, like, uh, you know, a press on this, uh, this uh, Chinese invasion into Taiwan, you know, de facto, because uh, once uh, the airspace is taken, your country is gone, you know, yeah, so the, the China, China is, uh, you know, it's going to take the air control. The China is gone, right? And I mean, uh, Taiwan's air control is taken by China. It's gone, right? Yeah, so it's a huge news in the United States and everybody else. You know, it's, a, it's a top line news, you know, the New York Times, everybody else. But there's no press right here at all. So that's, uh, I'm very, very shocked to hear about it. Yeah, because uh, that could, you know, directly, you know, uh, have a direct consequence, consequence of the existence of a, Japan as a country, right? So that's one, right? And then number two, like, you know, also, like, uh, Timothy, I share with you, you know, some of the data, so I'm very fascinated that the, the election has been already won or lost before it's been ever fought, right? Yeah, so it's kind of very fun or very interesting, you know? Yeah, so like Sun Tzu's, uh, you know, the thing, you know, that all the battles have been won before it's been ever fought, right? So I'm done talking, thank you. Thank you. Yes, I think you'll see um, increasingly a change of Japan with regard to Taiwan. I think there's a growing recognition that um, Taiwan's independence is a essential element of Japan's uh, defense strategy. It needs to be, sorry about the wind. 
um, and with Mr. Nikai now out of the mix, I think you'll be able to see a gradually a shift in Japanese foreign policy with regard to Taiwan. Woo! And um, about the list that, um, you know, the analysis of the various parties, and a lot of times you can already tell who's going to win and who's going to lose just by the the numbers that are being produced now. <clears throat> That's so much like many things here in Japan that even when you go to a meeting, the, the result of the meeting was already discussed and decided before that meeting. So it's, it's, it's somewhat similar to that, but yeah, the, it's hard to beat the numbers. Thank you. And I'm inviting also Yuka. Good evening to you. Hi, how are you? Fine. Good. Thank you. Okay, good. <laughs> Thank you, Timothy, for another great session. Um, I thought it was very interesting. You said uh, the election can be viewed as like a matsuri, like a festival. Actually, like a couple of days ago, I have heard some Japanese journalist. He called the election as matsuri goto. It's actually a little bit nuanced. You know, the seiji, the, you know, the Japanese word politics, sei can be, I think it's red as matsuri goto. So it's kind of nuanced. It's not like a haha -ha festival. It's more like a administering, but uh, there is some tone like a, it's, you know, like a, some excitement in the air. I think that's what he was trying to convey. But that's a sort of a side note. I have a question. This same journalist, and then I didn't know this until now, but at this point, after the diet dissolved, there is no lower house diet members, right? There are all ex members. So in, a, in essence, there is like a, there's empty in the lower house. That's why maybe they don't do the uh, concurrent election um, for the upper and lower house. But I have a question about this election system. What's the point of this? Why we do this like a, right after the prime minister is elected? Isn't that like, a, you know, the lower house being having no member? Doesn't it make Japan as a nation more vulnerable? Uh, maybe the upper house, you know, can decide on major policies if there is needed to. But what is the point of having this type of election system? Thank you. Thank you. So it's a parliamentary democracy. Um, when Mr. Suga was um, appointed as the, um, uh, rep the LDP chairman, the president of the LDP, and then as prime minister, there was that didn't involve any change of the lower house. The lower house and the upper house stayed in session, stayed um, in their seats. This time, the um, administration is um, in in it no position. Choice. It has no choice. It's in the constitution. It has yes. to have an election after four years. You know, this, this we don't, it's not something that was chosen by the government. It's it's in the text of the constitution. You know, after four years, the House of Reps is dead. Uh, so that's the only reason for this particular election in this case. Okay, four so there's a timing of that. Yeah, no, the timing is absolute. The, uh, the timing is a matter of days. The actual mm. date when the uh, current uh, administration, the current uh, House of Representatives would go uh, into, uh, would, would, would cease to be, would have been uh, October the 21st. Uh, what uh, Kishi has done, uh, Kishida, I'm sorry, has done is is dissolve it earlier. Uh, I, what their thinking was that, of course, uh, he'll be a new prime minister, there'll be a bounce in the poll, people will feel good about the situation, and they'll show up at the polls and vote for the LDP. Just like, and, and there was no reason to believe this, but it, it's it's the mythology of the LDP. This is the way that they like to think about, you know, the way prime ministers affect the the election. 
that's the the question is is why they keep trying this this uh, this same old uh, theory when it, it doesn't actually pan out and it didn't pan out in Kishida's case there wasn't a big bump up in the polls and now they're stuck uh, slogging toward an early election well one thing one thing he was able to achieve was that he killed the enthusiasm for uh, Governor Koike and uh, Tomin first, uh, first Nokai, to actually stand up and and uh, put together a a campaign to run some candidates, and it was just that just that one week really made all of the difference. So agreed, agreed on that. But I I perceived uh, Yuka's question to be more like, um, if if the a lower house is out of session, how does the government move forward? How that's that was my perception of of what the question was directed at. Since they're, that's they're also in the constitution. you are correct. You are correct, Timothy. Yes. Yeah, that's, yeah. That's also in the constitution. If it's necessary, the House of Councilors comes in as a unit, that's right as a, as a single uh, permanent uh, fixture of government. It it can make uh, laws and pass them all by itself uh, during this period of time. That's yeah. also written in the constitution. And the interesting part here is that there are some cabinet ministers who are in the upper house, very few. Um, so the, the, the prime minister in the cabinet can act as uh, an administrative body. But, yeah, it's, it's the, everything would fall onto the, uh, the upper house, which um, is unaffected by um, the election cycle of the lower house. But uh, from time to time, there is what's called a double election where at the uh, standard time for 50% of the upper house to be elected, the prime minister orchestrates it so that he closes down the lower house as well, and then they get a double run. So if, if the winds are in the sails of the LDP and they think they can increase um, by really um, you know, uh, coordinating the upper house and the lower house elections, and they've got a, a great story and uh, geopolitically things are going well, then people will appreciate the LDP and they could get a couple more seats. And even if it's, they just win by a couple of seats, sometimes they will do that. It's, it's that important. Yeah, but they don't do it anymore because of the coalition with the Komeito. The Komeito hates double elections uh, and will do anything. And, and, and they would force the, the LDP, no matter how strongly uh, the leadership might feel, uh, to keep the two things separate. Uh, it's the, we, they've, we've never had a double election when uh, the LDP has been in coalition with the Komeito. And, and it, it's because the Komeito concentrates on every election diff separately and doesn't like interference in its preparations for any one particular election. And, and, they, and they call the shots in that regard. So am I the only one it could be, who sort of questioned the validity of the part of the Constitution. I mean, it seems like it's imposed on us, no? Or well, well, there... well that's a tricky question. <laughs> it was voted upon by the uh, then, accepted by the then uh, existing uh, House of Representatives, 46-47, mm -hmm. The process of, of creating the constitution that came into being on May the third of 1947, uh, it was approved, uh, and uh, therefore you can say that yes, even though the text was written over a week by members of uh, the staff of General MacArthur, uh, that it was amended uh, with some amendments keep coming even coming from the the, the Socialist Party uh, that. Uh, it, it, it was passed by the then existing House of Reps, and it's an official document that has, up until now, never been changed. So to think that it's it's not legitimate is, uh, well, a, a, a possible talking point, but there are arguments against it as well. But it's 60 years old, right? And maybe longer. Um... Yeah. Well, I'm it's... nearly 60 years old, and I still think I'm pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> No, yeah, well, no, I have, I have no doubt. But, uh, yeah. but what, you, what you're saying is, is true. Of all modern democracies, the Japanese constitution is um, probably the only one that hasn't been um, uh, touched or revised uh, since its creation. 
I mean, while we're on the topic, I mean, it is within the LDP's genetic code to uh, revise the Constitution. So that's why Mr. Abe was so adamant about it. And that's why Mr. Uh, Kishida also has this this mandate or this um, direction to revise the Constitution. It, he, he kind of keeps it quiet, but it is something that is a part of LDP uh, philosophy. Thank you so much for you know organizing this room, Maya and Timothy. Since we started this room 36 weeks ago, Maya, um, it's always been hot and heavy. There's always been a change from week to week. I'm so grateful for everybody being interested. And, and comments like yours, uh, Yuka, just really um, inspire me. They tell me that, you know, this decision to to create this room um, with Maya was the right decision. And there is an appetite. And there's plenty to talk about. Every week when we get together as a, as a team, um, we, we are exploring new issues that are coming up. It's not something that you can deal with on a monthly basis. This is, you know, if you, if it's important, um, to you, to your business, or you're a Japanese living overseas, or you're a foreigner that's living here working in this economy, you know, we try and focus on the stuff that is important to you as an individual. Just focus on those things that really are topical and important to us on, on a long-term and a short-term, um, basis. So, uh, Maya, Thank you again very much for, for uh, creating this room, for um, sponsoring it and um, keeping us together and, of course, uh, on topic every, every month, every week. Right. Thank you. Thank you for your dedication and the hard work. This was Japan Expert Insights Room on Japanese politics. Thank you for coming and staying with us today. We will be on air next Sunday at 8.30 in the morning, Japan time again. So join us. Until then, you can find us at japanexpertinsights.com and our YouTube channel, where we upload all the conversations on Japanese politics, business insights, and the role of Japan in the Indo-Pacific region. If you want to stay informed about our upcoming events, you can follow us on Clubhouse, LinkedIn, and Facebook. Again, we're looking forward to your joining us next week. Until then, stay well and enjoy every day as much as possible. See you.